We are in the course of uh, trying to go through our how and why we give a biblical understanding of biblical giving. And uh, I know a lot of people think that this is a, a subject that's rather tactile and you know and they might not enjoy it but I'm telling you when you understand that giving is one area not the only area it's one area where we are able to exercise our faith in a substantive way and we are able to see the response of God in a substantive way so giving is an exciting area. When you really get this down, the longer you serve the Lord, the longer you're in the faith, the longer, you know, folks that have been tithing and giving for many years can tell you story after story after story because God is faithful. <laughs> and, you know, I remember hearing, brother, when I was young, preachers get up and say, the Lord won't never owe you nothing. You can't outgive God, you know. And I'd hear them say that. And, of course, as a young person, you've got all kinds of ideas about how God's supposed to do things, you know. And so anyway, as time would go on, you know, as a young person, I'm thinking, yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> but as I got older and as I, well, I, I really can't even hardly say that because I started tithing as a teenager and I've seen God bless it from that time till this. But anyway, but as you get older and you experience more and more of it, then it becomes so natural to you. It, you literally, it becomes so, you just become liquid in terms of your giving. Tommy looks at me sometimes like I'm half stupid because something will come along and it'll require that we give of ourselves, you know, give of our own resources, and it may break us for the rest of the month. You know, we may be flat busted for the rest of the month. And I'll say to him, well, but God's going to take care of us. And he looks at me like, oh yeah, you know, sure, that's an easy way to explain it away. I'm not kidding. When I say it, I'm not kidding. Exactly. And you know what happens? God takes care of us every single time. But you see, when you haven't been around it a long time, when you haven't done it and experienced it and seen the results of it like I have, then you don't really, you know, you don't have that experience yet. But this is one area where if people will learn to dip their toe in the water, uh -huh. God said in concerning tithing in Malachi, try me and see. He said, put me to the test and see if I don't honor what I'm telling you, you know. And if people will learn to put their foot in the water, Jack, and try him and see, because he's going to prove himself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, you're going to know, you know, what that God honors what he says. So anyway, we have gotten to the place in our study this week. We are now up to the concept of fellow, what I refer to as fellowship offerings. And uh, these are offerings which allow ministers to do their work. Offerings provided for sacrifice and ritual obligations. Uh, when we give to provide the church with those things required for worship or service. In other words, furniture, church buildings, you know, instruments, supplies, uh, the things that are necessary to... Uh, to run the church office, you know, and those sorts of things. This is a fellowship offering. In Exodus 29, verse 28, the NIV, so it's a little bit clearer to understand for folks, it says, this is always to be the regular share from the Israelites for Aaron and his sons. It is the contribution the Israelites are to make to the Lord from their fellowship offerings. Okay, now let's move forward a moment. When we give to the Lord in an effort to provide the church with those instruments needed for the operation and function of the ministry, we are giving a fellowship offering. 
What the Lord just spoke of in that last passage was he, he calls it a fellowship offering. All right, for instance, if you buy a pew for the church, when the little church I grew up in, when we built a new church building, pews are not cheap. Oh, let me tell you, people, you know, church furniture is not cheap. And so what happened was when we built our new building, uh, the church, the pastor and all, uh, they offered families and individuals in the church the opportunity to buy a pew for the church. And what you would do is you bought the pew and then they put a little, uh, just a little brass plate on it and it said this pew was provided by the Bell family or Donald and Eleanor Bell, whatever the case might be. And so they gave people in the church an opportunity to buy a pew. Well now, you're buying a pew, but that is a fellowship offering. Correct. Because what you're doing is you're giving in order to help the church to do the work and in order to provide the resources necessary. Do you follow what I'm saying? Tithing is for the support of the ministry. Fellowship offerings are for what? To provide everything else. Okay, everything else that is required for the ministry to function and operate, that's your church building, that's your furniture, that's your light bill, that's your gas bill. All of those things fall under the heading of a fellowship offering. So if you buy a pew for the church or you give toward a pulpit or the piano or an organ or baptistry, whatever, that would fall under the category of a fellowship offering. In 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 11, this is something Paul said to the church at Corinth. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. So you're not supposed to give when you have a need. Hoping that God's going to get back to meet your need. That's not how it works. You do not give of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. What does grace mean? Unmerited, unearned favor. So what he's saying here is saying God is able to make all favor abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things. He's saying all your needs will be met may abound to every good work. So you can't do what God asks you to do if you're starving to death. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have the strength. You can't do what God's called you to do if you don't have clothes on your back. So Paul is saying, God is able to, allow, to cause his favor to shine upon you so that every need you have will be met. Why? So you can do what he's called you to do. Okay, Because God, in the law, God said you have to treat the animals a certain way that you use out in the fields, grinding corn. You've got to take care of those animals. That was in the law. You don't use them up like a rag and, you know, and, and not care for them. And if they're sick, not call for the vet you know, and not feed them and not water them and take care of them. No. Well, now, don't you think God, is if he's asked us to share the gospel, if he's called us to do a work for him, don't you think he's going to take care of us? Mm -hmm. That's what Paul is saying here, okay? Now, in verse 9, As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness being enriched in everything to all bountifulness which causeth through us thanksgiving 
to God. Now, to him that ministereth seed to the sower, God is the one that provides seed to the sower. Now, television preachers, thanks to Oral Roberts back in the 1950s, Oral Roberts in the 1950s started using the term sow seed when it comes to money, okay? Oh, you need to sow seed into this ministry. If you'll sow seed into this ministry, bless God, God will bless you back. And of course, Oral Roberts put it forth like, you sow a dollar and you're going to reap ten dollars. <laughs> but you see, spiritual things do not always work that way. That's right. And God does not keep books in that fashion. I've used this example before, and I'll use it real quickly again. Some years ago, I, it, I mean, it's been quite a while now. It's probably been 10 years ago. I was here in Dallas, and I had a phone company, like a, a, a cell phone company, you know. Uh, apparently, I had run out of minutes. You know how that used to work, you know. And I had all these old fridges and stuff. And my phone bill came in, and it was so high this one month. And here I was, didn't have an income. I mean, literally had no income, and uh, I didn't know what to do. And I prayed, and I said, Lord, I don't care how you do it, but it needs to get done, and there ain't nothing I can do. I said, please, Lord, somehow take care of this situation. Well, lo and behold, no sooner did that happen than I got another bill from, I, I don't remember exactly, but I'm wanting to say it was like an electric company. And for some reason, my bill on the electric bill was so high, it just blew my mind. And I said, Lord, between the two of these bills, it was something like $800 worth that I did not have money for. I was looking at my electric being turned off. I was looking at losing my phone. Because there's no way I could pay all that extra money, okay? There was no way. And I said, Lord, I don't know how you can do it. I'm not going to ask you to send me the money. Because God's bigger than money, honey. Yes, he is. See, this is the mistake a lot of people make. They don't understand that when God said He is able to cause all grace, all favor to shine upon you, they're figuring, you know, dollar for dollar. Well, bless God, I tithe, so God should give me that much more money back. Well, first of all, you may not be that good at handling money. I could name family members I've got. You could give them a million dollars tomorrow, and they'd be broke the day after tomorrow. Probably filing for bankruptcy, okay? So you may not even be all that good at handling money. And because our Heavenly Father is as, at least as smart as our earthly father, He looks at us, He knows what we're capable of, He knows how we handle things, and there are many times when we have needs, if all we'll do is put it in Daddy's hands, He'll take care of it. That doesn't mean he's going to give you the money to pay the bill. It may mean he'll figure out a way to get rid of that bill. Well, let me tell you, I got on the phone, I called the cell phone company, and I talked to them. And I told them, you know, I forget what the situation was, but you know. And I explained everything to them and everything. And do you know that that guy said, well, give me just a minute. And said, let me see what I can do. But, but, but he comes back and he said, well, how about this? And he lopped off something like 80 or 90% of what they said I owed them in overages. Wow. Yeah. Boom. Now I'm down where I'm only about $200 or $300 over budget for the month, okay? So then I call the electric company. And I talk to them and I explain everything to them and blah, blah, blah. And, and as I recall, I'm, I'm thinking this when I was living over there in, uh, in uh, Garland. And you remember I had those big uh, glass doors on the back of my apartment. And those boogers, the sun come in and heated that apartment up so bad that my uh, 
my AC bill was through the roof because I had huge sliding glass doors. Well, what I eventually did, thankfully, my sliding glass doors faced the back of the building so you couldn't see them from the parking lot or anything, and there were woods behind me. I put up aluminum foil on the windows so that it reflected the light back outside, right? When I did that, my electric bill come down like you want to believe. Well, I explained, if I recall correctly, I explained to the guy at the electric company, I said, I finally figured out why my electric bills were so high. I said, and I've put aluminum foil on the windows, you know, trying to make sure it don't happen again, blah, blah, blah. I said, but I really, I'm on disability, you know, I don't, I, well, I didn't even have any income right then. And I said, you know, everything, well, anyway, make a long story short, they came back and said, we're going to just lop that amount off. And they said, now, as long as your bill next month shows, like you said, if it's considerably lower, then we'll know that you did what you said you did to try to prevent this from happening again. And, of course, it did. My electric bill literally came down just by putting aluminum foil on those windows. My electric bill came down like 200 and something dollars a month. Wow. That's how bad the heat coming in was affecting my air conditioning bill, okay? So anyway, God didn't move on just one business. He moved on two mm -hmm. to lop off a huge amount. That had to be God. You know, you, you could almost say it was circumstance if one of them did it, you know? Mm -hmm. But two of them, back to back, I called one and they did it. I called the next one and they did it. You know, that was miraculous. All of a sudden, Jack, I didn't owe all that money. <laughs> now see, God responded. He gave back to me. Mm -hmm. Say, well, no, he didn't because you didn't get a check in the mail for $800 to pay them bills. Oh, yes, he did because that's $800 I didn't have to pay. Mm -hmm. That's right. So in my books and in God's books, God gave me $800. You know, that's what it boils down to, okay? But the Word of God said, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So, the harvest that we get is entirely dependent on God. No, on us. If you plant one tomato bush in your backyard, don't plan on growing enough tomatoes to supply ragu with tomatoes for, you know, their production factory. It isn't going to happen. It just isn't going to happen. I know people who, Christian people, spirit-filled Pentecostal Christian people who are so cheap. I don't even know what other word to use. They are so cheap and they are so ungiving. And then things come into their life and things come along and boy, they just have a fit. Oh, Brother Jack, they just blow a gasket. And when I sit there and I tell them stories about how the Lord has provided for me and how the Lord's done for me, they're sitting there looking at me. They don't understand. They've never experienced that. They never had that happen for them that way. No, bless God, every time something like that comes along, I wind up having to pay it. I wind up having to pay the bill. The electric company never done that for me. Phone company never done that for me. There's a reason for that. Because if you sow sparingly, then you're going to reap sparingly. And these are people who... When, you know, somebody at work is getting married or having a baby and they come around and they're taking, you know, they'll take a little offering, you know, everybody give a few dollars, you know, to give to this new mother-to-be or whatever. And I have a member of my family, and I'm not kidding you. She'd come home for us. Well, bless God, they had somebody coming around work today. She worked at a school. I had somebody coming around work today. One of the teachers is having a baby. They're taking an offering for her. Well, I didn't give nothing. I ain't trying to... Every time, Jack. Every single time. And I thought to myself, now her co-workers are all seeing this. What does that make her testimony look like? Well, if I gave to everything to come along, bless God. Blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what? If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. This isn't all about money you give to the church. No. It's about 
how you give, period, regardless. And whether or not, because I'm going to tell you, God honors generosity. God will bless generous people. They don't even have to be a Christian. That's right. That's right. They don't even have to be a Christian. If they're a generous person, let me tell you something. Because people who know how to use their resources to be a blessing, God will bless. Why? Why wouldn't he? <laughs> You're somebody who makes sure people eat when they're hungry. You're somebody who makes sure somebody gets gas when they need gas. The Lord's going to make sure you get resources to take care of them people. You're a conduit for Him. You're an outlet for Him. So the more we're a blessing and the more we try to be a blessing and reach out to people, the Lord's going to bless you back. He's going to bless you. doesn't have to be a church-related offering can be your neighbor is stuck and you know needs a little help and you help them with something the Lord will bless you for that he will bless you for that okay so let's look at the concept now that passage we just looked at talks about the seed and the sower and I mentioned how that uh, this whole concept of sowing seed you know started with Oral Roberts back in the 1950s but let's look carefully at this concept God provides seed to the sower when you have an abundance do you recognize it as seed given to you by God to be sown or do you merely consume it and ignore the potential that existed for the seed to be sown. You see, let me explain something to you. Seed is not about the little tiny bit you have to start with and bless God, you plant it in hopes that it will become more. That's not how the concept of seed in the That's Word right. of God works. That's right. According to the Word of God, listen carefully now because this is exciting. Seed is born out of abundance. Yep. Seed is never born out of lack. You give a poor person who's starving to death a tomato, and they're going to eat that tomato. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you give a poor farmer 300 tomatoes, mm -hmm. he's going to eat and he's going to take some of those tomatoes, he's going to clean them out, he's going to wash the seeds, he's going to set them aside, now he's got something to plant when the season comes around. Do you follow what I'm saying? But when you're in a state of lack, it's not about, Brother Jack, trying to get the seed out so you can grow food later. No, you're going to eat everything that's available to you. Right. Seeds and all, am I telling the truth? But seed, according to the Word of God, seed is about abundance. And many, many times what will happen is God will give us seed. He will give us abundance. Boy, I got this check in the mail I wouldn't expect it. Or I got this big income tax return. Or my company gave me this big uh, bonus and it was more than I ever expected, you know. Okay, now, do you look at that and do you see seed anywhere in there? You just got, I'm going to put it, I'm going to be like we're in grade school. You just got 50 bushels of apples. When you see all them apples, are you seeing 10,000 apple pies? Or are you seeing 5,000 apple pies and a whole bunch of seed that I can invest so that next season I'll have 20,000 bushels of apples? Do you see what I'm saying? A lot of Christian people do not understand that when God gives us those occasional windfalls, those occasional blessings, there's seed there. He's given us more than we need to consume for ourselves. Are you following what I'm saying? And He's given us more so that now we have the opportunity to use part of that to sow so that later we can reap even more. This is why people don't understand that 
there, there are times, you know, people say, bless God. Well, if, if the concept of seed then is based on abundance, well, I don't have abundance. All I ever have is barely enough to pay my bills. Okay, fine. You don't have any seed to sow. You don't. If, if all you can do is make ends meet, you don't have any seed to sow. But just watch and see if the Lord doesn't allow you an occasional windfall. Just watch and see. And then let's see what you do with that windfall. How many people, brother, just gobble it up? I went out and bought me a new 50-inch television. And then they're right back to struggling to buy groceries next week. I watched a video online that was so inspirational and so sweet. Here, there's homeless people. And this man walks up to a homeless man and he offers him some food that he had bought somewhere, you know, a couple sandwiches or something. And he offers this homeless man, he said, I bought these sandwiches, would you like them, you know? And it was a social experiment. The, the guy who was videotaping knew what he was doing. And the homeless man says, oh, well, thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. And then he immediately goes to another homeless person and says, I got some sandwiches, would you like one? Do you see? There's more than I can eat. Oh my God, have mercy. It's a momentary windfall. He's gonna be hungry tomorrow. He may be hungry later tonight. He could save one sandwich. He could easily justify holding on to that second sandwich because I might be hungry tonight. But he doesn't. He sees that second sandwich as seed. Do you follow what I'm saying? And this is why, Brother Jack, our little church is small. We don't have a lot of money. Most of the time we're blessed if we can pay our church rent and, you know, and our bills for the internet and all. That's all we got. But then an offering will come from, from Claude or somebody. And we'll have some money in the bank. Oh, yeah, we're going to build our outreach center. Yeah, we're going to do some things with that money. But you know what? I get somebody walk up to me in the parking lot at AutoZone and say, Sir, is there any chance you could help me? My husband and I are trying to pay our hotel. We're staying at a weekly hotel. We're trying to find work up here. We wash windows. We go to businesses and wash windows and said, today we've had a terrible time. We were trying to make the money to pay the last of our rent. She said, I've gotten, she showed me, she said, I've got like $80, but we need a total of, let's say, 120 you know. She said, but we couldn't, nobody would let us wash the windows today. She said, so we don't have what we need. And uh, we had just gotten some money. So the church happened to have some money in the bank. And I said, opportunity to sow some seed. I'm not going to look at that money we've got like, well, bless God, our church struggles. So when we finally get a little extra cash, we're going to hold on to every penny we got. No. But the Lord spoke to my heart and said, help these people. I said, okay. So to make a long story short, I went up to the hotel where they were staying and we paid a week rent for them. Plus they owed like $25 for the previous week. We paid that for them. And when she tried to give me, she tried to give me the money she had in her hand. And I said, no, ma'am, y'all need to eat. You need to buy gas. I said, how can you go, you know, try to find work if you're hungry and if you don't have any gas in your car? I said, no, you keep that. I said, but now we've helped you with a week, and I hope, I hope that gives you enough of a head start that you can kind of hit the ground running from here. Okay? So, and Tommy can tell you, Tommy can tell you, knowing me 14 years, my brother was going through a really horrible situation several years back. And he wound up in jail, and he did not have the money to pay to get out of jail. His ex-wife accused him of something, and it was a mess, a horrible mess. And uh, eventually he wound up winning everything, you know, but it took, literally took almost two years. He was in jail almost a year. He finally was able to get out and he worked a deal with a bondsman and the bondsman let him out on payments, like on a payment schedule. 
and uh, he needed to pay the bondsman by, you know, I'm going to say uh, the first of the year, $1,200 or something like that to stay out of jail to pay the rest of it, you know. And he was telling me, he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have that money. I don't have the money. I had no income. None. Had had no income for four years. Zero. No disability. Nothing. Okay. I mean, the city was helping me pay my rent. I was in a pretty bad financial spot for a long time there. All of a sudden, it was like Christmas Eve. I wanted so bad to be able to get Tommy something for Christmas. I felt so horrible that I could not get him anything. It just, it tore me up, Jack, one side down the other. And I said, I'm going to look at my account in New York. Every once in a while, Claude would surprise me. I never know when he's going to give. I never know how much he's going to give. I never know what reason he's going to give. But he has my account number up there. And when he wanted to give me personally, not the church, when he wanted to give me personally any kind of a gift, he would just go to the bank in New York, which I had the same account with the same bank for many, 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 many years. He would go there. He would deposit a check into my account. And because it was deposited in the same state that it was written in, the money would be available to me on my ATM card the next day. Instead of having to wait for him to mail in and me to deposit it and then wait 10 days for it to clear. We kind of figured all this out several years back. So I said, I'm going to look at my account just to see if by any chance at all, maybe Claude decided for Christmas or something. Now, did he do that regularly? No. No, not at all. So I'm just doing this on a lark because I felt so horrible that I couldn't give Tommy anything for Christmas. So I go into my account and I open it up and I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I go into sheer shock. And all Tommy hears me saying is, Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, oh dear Jesus, oh Lord Jesus, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. And he said, what's wrong? I said, oh Jesus, oh Lord Jesus, oh thank you Jesus, oh Jesus, oh Lord thank you Jesus. What's wrong? Oh Lord Jesus, oh thank you Jesus. It took me a while to be able to tell him. I had a balance in that account of just under $24,000. I didn't know what had happened right away, but I kind of figured it might be what I thought it might be. Social Security had cut off my disability for four years based on a rule change. I knew the rule change was unfair and I knew it victimized a lot of people. I did not have the money to fight it in court. I didn't have the money to find an attorney. Couldn't do nothing about it. So for over four years, I was without an income. Somebody somewhere challenged this rule in court, won the fight, and when they did, Every person that rule affected, Social Security came in and reimbursed us, not just a month, but they reimbursed us the entire four years that we had been cut off. So all of a sudden, all at one time, I had $24,000. That shows you how little I get from Social Security. If I get $24,000 for four years, I was getting $6,000 a year. That's about practically what I get now, a little over that. First thought in my mind, I said to Tommy, I said, I'm going to help my brother. I'm in a position I can help my brother. I can help him with it. And I was so tickled. $1,200. I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. I can help my brother. Isn't that the first thing I said? Mm -hmm. And then the next thing I said was, we're going to buy a house. 
because I figured when's the next time I'm going to have a big hunk of change like this to put down on a house, you know? I said, we're going to buy a house. And, uh, but the point being this, God will give us windfalls. He will give you abundance at times to see what you're going to do with it. Are you going to recognize seed in it at all? Are you going to see seed in it at all? If you do and you sow it, you're going to get a, you're going to reap a harvest. You're always going to reap a harvest. You do not sow seed in God's economy and not get a harvest back. That's right. You will always reap back, okay? So sometimes the Lord will allow us the opportunity to give as a means of sowing seed by allowing us a temporary abundance. What we do with this abundance then determines whether we will reap a future harvest or not. Okay, many will fail the test when the Lord allows them to benefit from abundance. And I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And they fail to see the opportunity to sow seed toward a future harvest. There are times when God will give you something and it's not meant for you at all. It's meant to pass through you. He wants to see if you'll let it flow through you. I'll give you an example. I had something happen several, well, I can't even remember how long ago it was, Brother Jack. I can't remember if you were, I don't think you were with us yet. I wound up with something happened and I wound up with like $250 that I just totally was not expecting. It just total come out of the sky. <coughs> And I said, oh, praise, I'm so happy, you know, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart and said, we were doing services at that point in two locations. We were trying to have church on Sunday evening in Garland, and we were doing church on Sunday morning or early afternoon in Fort Worth, okay, near Arlington. And because we've tried every location, honey, this church, we've tried every trick in the book to find people. I mean, we've fished in every fishing hole there is. And so we had one fella, Joshua, who lived out in Arlington. And I said, Josh, if we started holding meetings in Fort Worth, you know, toward the Arlington line, would you prefer that? Because it be a whole lot easier than him driving all the way up to Garland. And, of course, he loved the idea. And I said, if things take off over there, well, then we'll move our ministry over there because I'm going to go where the fish are, you know, and where the fish are biting, so to speak. So anyway, so we were holding meetings at two locations. And here I had this extra 240 or $250, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to give $20 to each person that comes to church at both locations this week. Now, of course, you know how many people we get come to church. We don't get, you know, a bunch of people. Didn't, didn't you remember that when I had to do that? And I looked at Tommy and I said, you're not going to believe what God's laid on my heart, what I have to do this week. He said, well, I said, I have to give this money away. This is not meant for me. It's meant to pass through me. It's not meant for me. I said, I'm supposed to give everybody that comes to church this week $20 each. Well, we had our service in Fort Worth, and Josh was there, and that one girl was there whose name I can't remember. And we, we might have had Tommy and I and maybe three other people there, okay? So there goes $60. Then we come to Garland that night, and at Garland we wound up having maybe five people show up or something, and there went, you know, $100. So I was left with a little bit, but not a whole lot. But I want to tell you, that entire thing was unexpected. That entire thing was a windfall. So in God's economy, in God's eyes, I had seed to sow. And he was literally putting me to the test. Are you going to be willing to sow the seed? Or are you going to hoard 
this blessing? Are you going to hoard this windfall and claim it for yourself? Well, I know God and I know how God works. And honey, I'm going to tell you something. If you sow the seed, you're going to get a harvest. Mm -hmm. And for every seed you sow, you don't know how many apples you're going to get or how many tomatoes you're going to get or how many squash you're going to get. But you're going to get a whole lot more than one. So here you got this little teensy thing, and when it comes back to you, it's going to come back a whole lot bigger. It's going to come back a whole lot more filling. It's going to come back, you know, a whole lot more beneficial. And so I say, when people see today how the Lord has blessed Tommy and I, I, I can tell you why. I can tell you why. It's not because we've hoarded every penny we ever get our hands on. It's not because we've always thought of ourselves first. It's not because we didn't care about the needs of the church and, you know, and the work of God. No, it's the exact opposite. It's because we've done the exact opposite. When I first met him, whisper under my breath, God, I don't want him... He was the stingiest thing. He was. You talk about somebody tight-fisted. Who, Lord Jesus. I, I practically had to beg them to feed me. <laughs> I'd have starved to death if I hadn't have begged him sometime. He, one time, he let me know, bless God, it's my money worth spending every time we go out to eat, you know. <laughs> Rub that right up in my face. Let me know. And then here I am, the one that don't have a whole lot of money, don't have a whole lot of resources, don't have a whole lot of nothing, but I'm a giver. Aren't I? Mm -hmm. I'm a giver. Give, 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 and give again. And then something comes along, Brother Jack, and... Well, somebody come to church, but they can't afford to buy a meal tonight. Well, that's all right. We'll buy a meal for them. Well, you, you know, and believe me, <clears throat> somebody who shall remain nameless, I'll just look his way and whistle, <laughs> would remind me, well, you know, that's going to break us. We ain't going to have any money left for the rest of the week. I ain't going to have any money till payday. And I'd say, booby, the Lord will take care of it. God will take care of us, trust me. And a lot of people think when you say that, Brother Jack, because they don't have the experience, they think that's just cliche. You know, they think you're just spitting out a phrase, you know. Well, the Lord will take care of us. That's not what's happening. When I say the Lord will take care of us, I mean exactly what I'm saying. And how many times, booby? Have we been in that very position? And I mean, we were down to nothing because we gave away the last of what we had. And I just got through saying to him, the Lord will take care of us. All of a sudden, Claude decided he wanted to give me a gift. All of a sudden, uh, he don't know nothing about what we just did. Claude don't know nothing about it. Out of the clear blue sky, he decided... You know what? I, I just wanted to send you a thousand dollars because I felt like, you know, you could probably use it and you guys probably need a vacation. And But you know what I'm saying? Out of the clear blue sky. And without fail, Martin, it came. It didn't come when we had lots of money in the bank. No, it came right after we just got through giving the last of what we had. And we were down to nothing. How many times, Booby, has that happened? Right. Over and over again. So, when you get this concept down, I'm going to tell you, and you begin to see God doing it. You begin to say, you, that doesn't mean you have to give everything away. But the idea is, when you have abundance, do you see the seed? Do you see the opportunity for seed in the abundance? That doesn't mean you have to give every bushel of apples away. It doesn't mean you have to cut every apple open and pull the seeds out of it. But do you use any of it to sow seed? 
And uh, as a child of God and as a Christian, we should be looking for the opportunity to sow seed. Mm -hmm. We really should. We should be looking for the opportunity because as children of God, we know God is going to give us a harvest. This isn't just cliche. This isn't just words coming out of our... We know it. When I was pastoring my first church many, many years ago, uh, Leo and Sue came to me. And they said, Brother, we know a lady, and she goes to an Assembly of God church down the road a ways, and she's divorced and has two kids, and she doesn't work, and she really just exists on... Uh, the money that her ex-husbands give her for alimony and child support and everything, you know, that's how she pays her rent and pays her bills and said she's a good Christian lady and she is a good mother, you know, and uh, she really struggles and tries hard, you know, but she has no groceries. She's without groceries. Now, she didn't go to our church. I didn't know her. Never had met her. I said, is there any way we could help her with some groceries? I said, of course there is. Of course there is. So after church, we went down to my little apartment downstairs because we were meeting on the third floor of this building and I had made a little apartment out of an office suite, three rooms, on the second floor of the same building. And so we went down to my little apartment and I got a box and I started pulling food off of my shelves in my little kitchen that I'd set up. And I'm filling this box up with all kinds of food. And Leo says, brother, you're, 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 you're emptying your cabinets. You're emptying your pantry. You, you're not going to have nothing left. I looked at him and said, oh, God's going to take care of me. <laughs> See, I know. <laughs> I know that God's going to take care of me. As far as I was concerned, what Leo and Sue had told me presented opportunity for me to sow some seed. That's, that's how I saw it. You, do you follow what I'm saying? Immediately, I saw it as an opportunity, Brother Jack. I'm, I got an opportunity. God's given me an opportunity to sow some seed. And I put all kinds of groceries. I mean, literally, by the time I got done, I didn't have a whole lot of canned food and stuff left, okay? or pasta and all that you know I put together about two boxes of stuff then I said they wrote down the address for me I said I'll bring it to her house and I'll leave it and uh, I said but I'm not going to tell her it's us I said I'm not going to I'm not going to tell her who's doing it. I said I'm just going to leave the food out in front of the house in, in on the porch I said and then I'll let you know when you call her and tell her just look out on your front porch so anyway I'm going to her house and the Holy Ghost speaks to me and says, would you want to eat a bunch of canned food and pasta and rice and stuff? I said, well, no, Lord, not me. I like meat. Boy, I like, you know, I, I'd rather eat a chicken than eat, you know, anything else. He said, well, then you go buy her some meat. So when you leave her groceries, you're not just leaving her starches and canned goods you're leaving her some meat as well now, course, you gotta remember this is New England this is winter time you can leave frozen goods out on the front porch for a month and they'll be okay <laughs> so I went to the store and I bought brother a big old thing of hamburger big old thing of pork chops a big old thing of breakfast sausage big old thing of I can't even remember what all uh, um, chunks uh, like stew meat you know chunks and all and I put all that it's in a shopping bag so now I go up to the front porch of her house and I put down two boxes of food and a bag of meat and I think I went ahead and bought a gallon of milk while I said it and some bread and some eggs because <laughs> I figured oh well if I'm this much invested might as well throw some other staples in there too that lady her name was Jude she was so thrilled out of her mind to get that food. And uh, 
she turned around and a couple few weeks later she showed up at our church and we were meeting on the third floor of that building I said well that building the, the windows were so old and rotting and uh, they since have remodeled the building thankfully so the windows are new and all and uh, but it was so dusty up there and she told me she said brother I'm asthmatic she said as soon as you move out of this this building and start having church somewhere else I'm going to come be a member of your church well about oh probably two months later we moved and that lady as soon as we moved she came and was a member of our church and was a marvelous member and a faithful member but the point is this again do we see opportunity to sow seed you see the whole concept of sowing seed is based on our faith do we genuinely believe that God is going to take care of us do we genuinely believe that God multiplies what we put out there do we really believe what Paul said about they that sow sparingly are going to reap sparingly do we really believe this or are these just words on a page because if we really believe it it's going to be manifested in our actions it's going to be manifested in what we do and how we do it and I got news for you it is going to come back to you because God never fails that's right never fails always comes back to you you will always always reap a harvest when you plant seed out of your abundance okay so many fail the test when the Lord allows them to benefit from abundance and they fail to see the opportunity to sow seed toward a future harvest so there are a lot of people those few times the Word of God said if you're faithful over little God will make you ruler over much so if the Lord, if you're broke and you're poor and all of a sudden God let you have just a little tiny windfall. Let's see what he does with a $20 windfall. Well, bless God, I'm going to spend it on me because I don't ever have no extra money. I'm going to give me. Guess what? That's the only windfall you're going to see. But if you'll take even a little part of that and you'll say, well, you know what? This uh, this little twenty dollars I got is, but maybe I, you know, I, I don't want to promote gambling or anything. But maybe you got it on a scratch off. And you say, well, it's twenty dollars that you know I didn't have yesterday, and I didn't expect it, you know. And you're walking out the store, and there's somebody hungry. You say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll go into churches and buy you, you know, a three dollar Tuesday two piece dinner meal. Do you follow what I'm saying? Do you see the opportunity in that windfall for a seed to be sown? All right. So this is how the concept of seed works. It is, seed is born out of abundance, okay? Now, if we look at the example in Exodus 35, verses 1 through 10, here we see what is referred to as a free will offering. Exodus 35, 1 through 10, and Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath commanded that ye should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord, Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Now we got people want to scream and holler that homosexuals ought to be killed. Well, let me tell you something. If you work on the Lord's day according to the law, you're to be put to death. Mm -hmm. Okay. Verse 3. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitation upon the Sabbath day. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord, what, uh, whosoever is of a willing heart, 
let him bring it an offering unto the Lord whosoever is of a willing heart remember what I said about it's not just what you do but it's how you do it so the Lord didn't just get up here and say bless God I command you to bring an offering no he said I only want people to bring an offering who are willing to bring an offering mm -hmm. because how you do it is ever been as important as what you do and there's a reason it says so every whosoever is of a willing heart let him bring it an offering of the Lord gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet this when you hear the colors the Lord don't want you bringing them colors he's talking about fabrics generally okay and textiles and fine linen and goat's hair and rams rams skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood and oil for the light and spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense and onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate and every wise hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded so God had instructed Moses to build the tabernacle but he had no resources. He had nothing to build it with. <laughs> he told them the materials he needed. And it was some pretty costly materials. And then he said, now go to the people and say to the people, all right, here's the list of materials I need to build the tabernacle. Ain't none of it cheap. <laughs> nothing I'm asking for here. And listen, we got people nowadays won't even peel off a $20 bill to help the church build a simple wood frame building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now the Catholic Church obviously has gone to the extreme where they build these ridiculously expensive and elaborate. I knew a little town in Pennsylvania years ago. They didn't have literally but 30 Catholics in the entire town, literally. And yet, they had this beautiful uh, stone church building, you know. And I knew one of the ladies in town who belonged to that church, a Catholic lady. And she told me, oh yes, we did that all by ourselves. We built that building, our little church, you know, our little 30 people, we did that all by ourselves. It took us 20 years Brother Jack, 20 years it took them to build that building. But bless God, for 20 years those people gave and gave and gave and gave. And we've got Christian people. Pentecost is about keeping it simple. We're not about elaborate. We're not about, we believe in the power of the message. We believe in the reality of the Holy Ghost. So we don't put our stock and our resources in buildings. And we don't build these big fancy edifices. And you know, well, we're not supposed to anyway. I'm not saying there aren't some Pentecostals that have gone the other way. Okay, don't misunderstand me. But as a rule, that is how we Pentecostals do things. Okay. And we got people that'll sit there and not sacrifice a thing in the world. And yes, I use the word sacrifice. There's a reason why this ministry is 14 years old in Dallas, Texas. And we haven't gotten a whole lot further than we've gotten in 14 years. And I won't tell you what that reason is. Because nobody with very few exceptions and and amongst those exceptions are Tommy and Jack I, I don't <laughs> I'm not excluding you <laughs> just because you're the only person in the room but they've been with us the longest okay uh, but very few people that have ever been part of this work outside of Tommy and Jack have been willing to sacrifice you don't build a church without people sacrificing mm -hmm. it's impossible you can't do it you've got to remember you're starting at the bottom and when you start a church 
what happens is the weight of the work rides upon precious few. So obviously, for as few as you've got to support the work that you're trying to do, they're having to carry a whole lot more of a burden. Mm -hmm. Obviously. Because the more people you get, then more evenly you, the burden becomes, okay? It's just like carrying a big box or carrying a big stone. The more people that come and join you and get underneath it, well obviously then it gets lighter and easier to carry that box or to carry that stone. Mm -hmm. Well, when you start a church, you're starting with few people. If anything you're going to do, you need everybody to sacrifice. Everybody has to. Well, I've been starting churches for 30 years. When I started churches in the mainstream, I didn't even have to tell people that. Those words never even came off my lips. They just did it. They believed in what we were doing. And they loved their pastor, and they loved their church, and they supported it. And bless God, when we were trying to move to a little bit bigger facility, because we outgrew the one we were in, you know, and we needed to come up with uh, the, the, the security deposit or whatever, you know, the first month's rent. Let me tell you, I just told the folks what we were trying to do, and my God, folks figured out a way to get it done. I had one time, I'll never forget it, because we, we needed exactly $1,200. Mm -hmm. We needed it for a, if I remember correctly, you got to remember, this is my first church. This was back in the 80s. I think we needed it for the first month's rent and deposit on a place we were trying to move into. And I happen to remember Brother this Pentecostal preacher who was a friend of our family all the years that I was growing up. Brother Tadlock used to say, I don't talk to the people of God when we have a need because they ain't got it. He said, I talk to the God of the people because he does. <laughs> That's right. So he didn't get up and talk to the people about, we need this amount of money, we need that amount of money. He didn't do it. He said, I talked to the Lord about it. He said, you know what? God find a way to put that right in my hand. Well, I was a young man, 19 years old. I figure I'm going to try Brother Tatlock's method and see how it flies. Lord, we need $1,200. And I'm not going to tell the church we need $1,200. I'm just going to tell you we need $1,200. And that Sunday, I'm up in front of the church. We're having our prayer before service, you know. And one of the fellows in the church's name is Stan. And Stan walks up to me and he said, Pastor, real quiet, real timid kind of guy. He worked for UPS. He drove truck for UPS. And he said, the Lord laid on my heart to give this to you. And he handed me a check and it was folded. Well, we had a little, we had chairs on the pulpit, you know, on the platform. And we had a little table in the middle with a little drawer. So I said, well, praise the Lord, brother. Thank you. God bless you. And I put the check in that little drawer because we were just about to start church. I didn't even look at it. Put it in the drawer, close the drawer, so I'll get to it later. So we have church. I don't say a word about our need $1,200. I don't take offerings. We don't pass offering plates at the end of the service. I gathered because we did what we did back then was we had offering plates and people would come up front and put their offering in before or after church, you know, but that's how we did it. We didn't have uh, the box or anything at the back. We just left the offering, but we never moved them off of the communion table. Anyway, so I'm gathering up the offering and I keep a record of, you know, everybody's giving and all that. And I said, well, Lord, we sure, we sure don't have enough quite here to get into that building and then I said oh wait a minute Stan give me that check I've got and I go to the platform and I pull out that check and I open it up and guess what that amount was on that check take a wild guess twelve hundred dollars even hadn't even told anybody see I'm telling you folks when you've experienced some of the things I've experienced, you don't question whether God's real or not. You really don't. Because you, He makes Himself so real to you. 
that it's not even funny. You, God will be so real to you that you know. And uh, that's why I say, Paul said, for we know whom we have believed in. Well, oh, wait a minute, Paul. You're kind of contradicting yourself there because you're saying that you know and that you believed. Well, knowledge is not belief. No, when you believe something, that's on faith. You're taking it on faith. But what Paul was saying was, I believed enough till now I've seen enough that I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My faith has become knowledge. And that's what happens with giving. It, it's what happens as you give and you seek God give back. Am I telling the truth, Booby? Mm -hmm. You've been with me 14 years and he's a whole lot more generous now than ever he was before. Because he has seen what I'm talking about. God makes himself so real over and over and over and over again till you will be absolutely, you won't have a question in your mind if God's real or not. And there are people who will argue and fight with the preacher on the issue of giving. <laughs> and I just stand there and think to myself, you idiot. <laughs> you don't realize what God is trying to do. This is one area where God can open up to you a whole brand new revelation of Himself. That's right. This is an area where God can reveal Himself to you, where God can show Himself to be real to you, and you're going to stand there and argue with the preacher. Because bless God, you hate the fact that the church talks about money. Well, I'm sorry. I wish church buildings just magically appeared on land. I wish they didn't have a mortgage. I wish we didn't have to buy the property that they're built on. I wish we didn't have to pay electric bills. I wish we could provide you a place to go worship and shout and dance a little. I wish we could provide you a place to go understand the Word of God and find inspiration and hope and help when you're in trouble. I wish we could all we could just do that without a single nickel ever passing hands. But it don't work that way. That's right. And furthermore, God doesn't want it to work differently. That's right. Because the area of giving is one, not the only, but one tangible area where God can make himself real to us. And people who have learned to give biblically have a much deeper conviction concerning the reality of God than people who have not. That's right. Why? Because without fail, when you give and you put the principles of God's word to the test, without fail, he causes that harvest to come in over and over again. He causes, like he said, given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. And he causes favor to shine upon you. This week alone, We've had, what, at least twice, I recall, where we had our, what do we call these? Blessings. What do we say? Thank you, Jesus. At least twice this week, I remember having these moments because God give us favor with somebody, and they just said, no, I don't, no, I don't need any of your money. Keep your money. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. One of them was simple. Tommy and I went to Fort Worth to visit with Aunt Dorothy and Uncle Travis and Janelle. And on our way back from Fort Worth, we stopped at a, uh, a Popeye's fried chicken, you know, to have dinner. Well, we ate dinner, and after dinner, I was really just, uh, my blood sugar must have been low or something because I was just craving something a little bit sweet. And I'm not really a big sweets eater. But, oh, I was craving something so bad. And I went up to the counter and I said to the girl, I said, do y'all have any kind, because I didn't see it on the menu, I said, do you have any kind of dessert items at all or anything? She said, yeah, we have apple pie and blah, 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 you know. And I said, well, how much do you get for your apple pie? And she was like, one thirty-nine or something like that. Not to be cheap, 
But, uh, you know, McDonald's, they only charge like 79 cents or two for a dollar, you know. And so I said, $1.39 just for one? I just looked at my wallet. I've got two dollars. I said, "Okay." I said, "I'll go ahead and take it." So she goes over there. And said, "Well, there ain't but one left." She said, "You get the last one." I said, "Oh, okay, good." She brings it over to me, puts it in the bag, hands it to me, and I go to give her my two dollars. She said, "No, don't want it. You can have it." I said to Tommy, "What do we call that?" The answer is a blessing. What do we say? Thank you, Jesus. Say it's only a dollar thirty-nine, but I'll tell you what: when that happens to you, over and over and over and over, like it happens to us, over and over, that is the Lord causing His grace, His favor, to shine upon us. Okay, that's how He read. That's the harvest coming in from all your giving in faith. All right. So Moses took an offering. You'll notice God did not come in and say, you all must give 10% in order to build this. No. Uh-uh. The tithe had nothing to do with the building of the tabernacle. That's right. Your tithes, if you give and if the church uses the money biblically, your tithes should not go toward building a new church building. Your tithes right. should not go toward paying the electric bill. That is not where that money belongs. That money specifically belongs to the leadership and the ministry. Okay? And so free will offerings are what we use for the thing, for the construction of the tabernacle and these sort of things. So a fellowship offering is a free will offering. Okay? It falls under the category of, of a free will offering. Now, in Exodus chapter 35, 11 through 21, continued. This is the NIV now. The tabernacle, his tent, and his covering, his statues, and his boards, his bars, his pillars, and his sockets. Mind you, the term his is being used here to refer to the tabernacle. Okay. The ark and the staves thereof with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table and his staves and all his vessels and the showbread, the candlestick also for the light and his furniture and his lamps with the oil for the light and the incense altar and his staves and the anointing oil and the sweet incense and the hanging for the door at the entering in of the temple tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with his brazen grain, his staves and all his vessels, the laver and his foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars and their sockets and the hanging for the door of the court, the pins of the tabernacle and the pins of the court and their cords, the clothes of service to do service in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. So in other words, this is all stuff directly, specifically related to the conducting of the work of the tabernacle, okay? And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses and they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for the holy garments. This offering, not one penny of it, not one part of it, is to be used for any purpose but the tabernacle. So, the offerings that come into the church should not wind up in the preacher's pocket. That's right. If he goes outside of the tithe, uh -huh. he's robbing from God. Uh -huh. The tithe is his. Uh -huh. God gave him that. 
Now, I'm going to tell you, there are preachers that have done it. Yeah. I've known preachers, I've seen preachers run off with building funds. Mm -hmm. Now, building fund, that's all strictly offerings. Mm -hmm. They are stealing from God. You have not stolen from people, you have stolen from the Lord. Because that is God's money that, God people, that God's people gave as a free will offering unto the Lord for the work of God's kingdom for whether it be for building a building whether it be for providing you know garments that are used in, in you know uh, baptistry robes you know because uh, sometimes churches are you robes that we baptize folks in so they're not all exposed you know when they come out of the water and all that but I mean anything related to the physical working of the ministry is covered by offerings, okay? So that's why we give tithes and offerings. Because the tithe specifically goes in one area and the offerings specifically go in another. But the preacher has no business. And this is why, for instance, when Brother Jack gives his tithe each week, he tells me, he either tells me verbally or he'll put it on the, the envelope. This much is tithe, this much is offering. So if, in fact, I do need to benefit from the tithe in any way, then I know, okay, this, this much of that I can even look at. Do you follow what I'm saying? If we happen to have enough to pay all the bills and there's money left over, and I say, well, bless God, hallelujah, I can actually get $30 from the church this week because i got to pay this bill. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I can do that because I know how much the tithe, you know, of course the tithe honestly is way more than I would ever use, you know, but the point is we separate what is tithe and what is offering, okay? Because the offering goes expressly to the work. And if money is given as an offering, then the ministry should never touch that money for any personal purpose. That's right. And that's important to understand because believe me, there's a lot of churches, there's a lot of preachers out there that don't do things scripturally. They don't do things God's way. And uh, especially, I'm not going to say it too plainly tonight because I'll make a whole bunch of enemies, but especially in certain communities, there are people who don't think nothing of dipping in wherever they feel like dipping in. And you don't do that. No, those offerings are given. You cannot repurpose those just because it suits you. No, if that was given free will for a purpose, it must be applied to that purpose. Free will offerings reflect the will and the heart of of the giver. Notice that the Lord does not even want those who have no heart to give to contribute toward the erection of the tabernacle. When that tabernacle gets built, God wants it to have been built by people who wanted to see it built. That's right. When we build a church, God's going to want that church to be built by people who wanted to see that church built. Amen. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. The intent is every bit as important. It, we can have, you know, some rich guy in town who just decides he's going to give money for whatever reason. No, God wants people who want to see that thing up. Mm -hmm. It's like Claude. I didn't hardly know what to do with Claude when he first talked to me about helping our ministry. But he said, I think what you're doing is extremely important to our community. This man's not even Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. He said, but I feel like what you're doing is I can see that what you're doing is so important for our community. You see? So he's given willingly. He's given of his own free will, but he's given because he wants to see what we're trying to do get done. Okay? Amen. Amen. Uh, God does not want anything offered to him to be offered by those who do not wish to participate. Although all will be able to benefit from it in the end. In other words, when the tabernacle gets built, 
Even the people who didn't give one single thing toward its building are still going to benefit from the tabernacle. That's right. They're still going to benefit, Brother Jack, from the ministry of the priest. Mm -hmm. Even though they didn't give a bloody thing in the world toward it. Mm -hmm. But who's going to get the blessing from the giving? Those who gave. But those who gave how? Of necessity? Begrudgedly? No. Of a free will who gave in faith and uh, the, the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. And I'm telling you when, you, when you get to know the Lord like I know the Lord, giving cheerfully is not a hard thing to do. It's not a hard thing to do. Even if, you know, somebody gets up at camp meeting and says, Folks, we found out we need to put a new roof on the old tabernacle this year and we're going to take a special offering to try to get this roof fixed. It doesn't, it, it doesn't hurt my feelings at all to whip out a 50 or whip out a 100 or whatever I can give. It, I'll do it in the drop of a hat. And I'll do it with the biggest smile on my face. Mm -hmm. Because again, I know... This is an offering. This is a free will offering. This is also an opportunity for me to sow some seed. God's not asking me to give my rent money. Do not give your rent money. God's not asking you to give your mortgage money. Do not give your mortgage money. If you do that, you are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Just putting it plain. If you do that, you are foolish. That is not faith. That is lack of wisdom. God desires that first and foremost, we be good stewards. He requires first and foremost that our testimony be good. You do not have a good testimony if you're giving your rent money away all the time and you're constantly having to go to your, your landlord and beg for his mercy and wait on you to come up with the money to pay him. That is not a good testimony, folks. No, what shows him God is real in your life is when you can pay your bills and pay them on time. So God wants you first to be a good steward. If then you have abundance... Now you have seed to sow. Sow that seed. And do it joyfully. Recognize, hey, hallelujah, God's given me an opportunity to sow some seed. All right.